Really appreciate that update that Bob just gave us. Uh, what a great example of what it is to, to serve with the community, to bless others who are now new to our community. And that's something that we're going to look at today. For the past couple of weeks, our series has been called Gift Giving Ideas. And in the first week of this series, we looked at a gift for you, the gift to enjoy a day of rest each week in the Lord. And then last week, we looked at a gift for the family. And the gift was enjoying a family meal together a couple of times a week, eating together. And this week, we're going to be looking at a gift for the community. Several years ago, I read a story about a 98-year-old woman named Verna Oler who lived in Long Beach, Washington. She was known around town as being pretty feisty. She cut her own firewood until she was into her 90s, but she was also known for being very frugal primarily as a matter of necessity she never made a lot of money in her work uh, so she never went to a hairdresser for example she figured she could cut her own hair for free she refused to buy new shoelaces when her shoelaces broke and instead would improvise by doing things like looping the zipper from an old coat through her boots I still have a hard time imagining just how that would work when a couple of her longtime friends bought her a new coat on sale, she sent it back because she found a cheaper one for just $2. Even though Verna didn't have a lot or didn't make a lot of money, she knew what to do with what she had. Turns out, Verna was a master investor. She knew how to make money in the stock market. And when she died in 2010, she left a fortune of $4.5 million. And with that fortune, she was able to bless her hometown of Long Beach, Washington. She put it in her will that every penny of that fortune would be spent on Long Beach, beginning with the community's first indoor swimming pool. And then whatever was left over was to be used for scholarships for kids and grants for teachers, and that's exactly what happened. Now, stories like hers are not super uncommon. You hear about them every so often as somebody who's led an extremely frugal life. Most people thought that they were uh, poor, that they didn't have a lot of money, but when they die, it turns out they had millions of dollars stashed away, never did anything with it. Well, the only difference with, with Verna is that she had a plan for all of her money. Well, let's say you are a, you're a Verna Oler kind of person and you've got millions of dollars. You have saved up a fortune and you have plans to use it to bless your community after you die. What instructions would you leave for how that money was to be used to bless your community? I think that could be a, a good conversation starter to, to have with your family as you are enjoying the gift of eating together to, to talk about what would you do if you had millions of dollars, how would you earmark that money to be spent on blessing the community of Columbus or wherever your hometown is? Well, for most of us, that's, that's just a fantasy. That would just be a fun conversation starter because most of us don't have millions of dollars. We're not amassing a huge fortune, so we'll probably never bless our community, right? Well, that, that is not true because regardless of how much money you have, every single one of us has the potential to bless our community. Each of us can give a gift to our community, and that's what we're going to be looking at Today, So if you have your Bibles with you, open them to 1 Peter chapter 2. Towards the end of the New Testament, towards the end of the Bible, 1 Peter chapter 2. And while you're doing that, let me explain a little bit of who Peter is writing to. This letter is a letter to Christians, to followers of Jesus Christ, to people who have put their hope in Christ, who trust that through his death and resurrection, they have been reconciled with God. They have been made new. They are sharers in his victory. In the Advent devotional I've been using this season, I read the best quote that sums up what it is that we have in Christ as his followers. The author, Trevor Hudson, writes, because of Jesus' life, crucifixion, and resurrection, we can trust that his joy is stronger than all its opponents. I love that line. We can trust 
that his joy is stronger than all its opponents, including death itself. He's right. No wonder the coming of Christ was announced by the angels to the shepherds with these words that it will be good news of great joy for all the people. But it's only those who put their faith in Christ who know that joy. As Peter writes in chapter 1 of this letter, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you don't see him now, you believe in him and you are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the end result of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Now, the Christians that Peter addresses in the first century, they share the same hope that we have 2,000 years later. But there is something else that we have in common with our first century brothers and sisters, and that's this. Following Christ goes against the grain of the world that we live in. That was true then. It's true now. At least it should be if we're taking our faith seriously. If you are taking your faith seriously, if you are living out your new life in Jesus Christ, it will go against the grain of this world, and that will create some problems in your life. And and that's what Peter is addressing throughout this letter, preparing Christians for how to respond when they are treated poorly. Our allegiance to Jesus Christ, our new life in Christ, our citizenship, in his kingdom, our ongoing transformation into his likeness, all of it will mark us as different from the world. We are in Christ, we are a different kind of people. So much about who we are just runs counter to things of this world. And when you go against the grain, the world gets irritated. The world gets out of sorts. And sometimes the world even responds with hostility toward those who proclaim and profess faith in Jesus Christ. That's why the world exerts constant and and heavy pressure on those who are different to conform, to go with the flow, to get with the grain. And when we do, when when we cave, when we compromise who we are in Christ, when we fall back in with the grain of the world, it may make things easier for us. Things might go better for us. But we also end up hurting the very people that we have been called to serve, that we have been called to engage, that we, that we have been called to, to lead out of darkness into the light of Christ. The gift of being different is a gift that the community may not readily accept, but it is a gift that the community desperately needs from us. And that's really the challenge of the text that we're going to look at, verses 11 and 12 of chapter 2 of 1 Peter. Peter writes, Dear friends, I urge you, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Here's a gift to the community. Give the community the gift of being different. Give the community the gift of being different. Now, to give that gift of being different, we, we, first of all, we have to embrace being different. And, and that's counterintuitive to us. We, we don't like to be different. Nobody likes to stand out. And yet, that's what we're called to do as followers of Christ. Last week, just last week, National Public Radio did a story on what some churches are doing to, as the title of the piece puts it, stay relevant for a new wave of worshipers. Now, this focus on on relevance is nothing new for the church. The the church has been wrestling with what it is to be relevant, to to accommodate culture for as long as I've been in ministry. That's been one of the biggest issues of the past 30 years for the church. 
And unfortunately, many churches have concluded that the way to be relevant is to compromise what it is that distinguishes us as followers of Christ from the culture. Basically, if if we just make following Christ less costly, maybe more will will come and and be a part of of, of our church, but but do they? I mean, think about it this way. Let's say in an effort to increase its membership, a local gym started to downplay strength training, started to downplay cardio workouts in favor of all-you-can-eat pizza nights. And let's say they took out the treadmills and replaced them with beanbags. I mean, who wouldn't want to be a part of that gym? That'd be an easy resolution to fulfill. And maybe it'd work for a little while. Maybe more would sign up, but sooner or later, those new members, they're going to realize, you know what? I don't need to go to the gym to eat pizza anytime I want. I don't need to go to the gym to lay around in a beanbag. I can do that at home. Well, the same kind of thing happens when the church downplays the call of Christ in order to make following Christ more appealing, more attractive, more relevant. As preacher Breck McCracken writes in a piece called Cool Christianity is a Bad Idea, he says it can be tempting for pastors and church leaders these days to get desperate, resorting to outrageous novelties and gimmicks to break through the noise and get people in pews. But remember, remember that if the faith we draw people to doesn't accurately reflect the faith given to us by Jesus, if it downplays the cost of discipleship, it will not be a sustainable or transformative faith. And what is that call of discipleship that is so off-putting to so many it is simply this come and die come and die no wonder it's so difficult to be relevant to the culture with that as our message to come and die and yet that's what Jesus says if any of you wants to be my follower you must give up your own way Take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it, he says. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. Those who take up the call of discipleship, who take up that call of discipleship to come and die, are by definition then going to be different from the world, especially today's world. Why? Because we are no longer governed by the passions and priorities of the kingdom of this world. No, we are governed by the passions and priorities of the kingdom of God. Holiness is our aim, not self-fulfillment, not self-actualization, not pursuing the desires of our hearts or the lusts of the flesh. No, our ambition, our pursuit is to be more like the one who saves us. As Peter writes earlier in this letter in chapter 1, Prepare your minds for action and exercise self-control. Put all your hope in the gracious salvation that will come to you when Jesus Christ is revealed to the world. So you must live as God's obedient children. Don't slip back into your old ways of living to satisfy your own desires. You didn't know any better then, but now you must be holy in everything you do just as God who chose you is holy there's no doubt this call to discipleship is a demanding one and that's why it is so off-putting to so many but but here's the here's the funny thing a church that is faithful to that call will be a church that is made up of people who more and more look like jesus which, more, which means more and more they will be as loving, as gracious, as, as, as honest, as pure, as sober, as compassionate, as forgiving, as servant-minded, as generous as the one who came to save us. The key to attracting people in our culture is not to become more like our culture 
The key is to become more like Jesus. Being different will come at a cost. There's no doubt. But being different is what the world needs from us if they are going to encounter the risen Christ through us. So we serve the community best not by downplaying, not by minimizing what that call to discipleship means, but by fully embracing it no matter the cost. And that's what Peter makes clear. He he makes it clear what what this cost or what this call is all about when he says in the first part of verse 11, dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles. An older version of the NIV translation puts it this way, dear friends, I urge you as aliens and strangers in the world. Foreigners, (laughs) exiles, strangers, aliens, This is what you are to the world if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, even if you live in the same town that you were born in. The moment you became a follower of Christ, you became a stranger, you became an exile, you became a foreigner, you became an alien to the community that you live in, even the community that you might have been born in. But that's okay. Because by being different, you offer to that community an alternative to the despair to the to the brokenness to the hopelessness that mark the kingdom of this world no in in, in you and in the difference that you are revealing because of who you are in christ others are discovering a better kingdom a kingdom of peace a kingdom where the broken are made whole a kingdom where hope is anticipation of what is to come because of what has already come. So if you are going to bless this community, if you're going to bless your community, then you must embrace being different because of who you are in Christ. Notice I say different, not better. You are not better than the people in the community around you because you are a follower of Christ. You're you're just different, but you are still a sinner. You are still a sinner in need of of grace and you're just sharing with other sinners who need that same grace that has saved and made you new. But just saying that you are different, just accepting that you are different doesn't really mean anything if you aren't truly different in meaningful ways. So since you are different, then be different. Now being different because of who we are in Christ can be summed up in two challenges. Number one, be good be good we tell our kids that all the time when they walk out of the house don't we be good be good well that's that's good counsel actually and it's something that we should encourage among each other as followers of christ be good now we've already looked at this just a little bit we are called to be holy as god is holy we are called to be like our savior in thought and in deed i I remember several years ago seeing a comedian on a television show doing a doing a bit about how hard it must have been to have been a younger sibling of Jesus Christ. He said, can you imagine? You, you do something wrong and your mother yells at you. Why can't you be more like your brother? And you're thinking, because he's the Messiah. Well, I think that comedian had a very good point. How can we expect to be like Jesus? He's perfect in every way. And what are we? We are not perfect in every way not only are we not perfect in every way we're not perfect in any way at all and that reality hasn't changed just because you have been baptized into jesus christ and your sins washed away now yes in that moment when you were buried with christ and raised up with him your soul was redeemed in that moment and 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 because of that moment we know that when christ returns our bodies will then be redeemed when he returns but in the meantime though our soul has been redeemed we still embody a flesh that is corrupted by so many evil desires and temptations. So being like Jesus, even with a redeemed soul, is no easy task, but that doesn't mean it's impossible because we have the Holy Spirit who is given to us at baptism. We've been given the gift of the Holy Spirit, Acts 2.38 tells us, and the Holy Spirit empowers us, but only in working with what he's trying to do in our lives. We must partner 
with the Holy Spirit. He's not going to force us. We don't become puppets on a string, no. And one of the ways is by engaging, by taking up, by joining in that fight against our lusts, our temptations, our bitterness, our hatred, as Peter urges to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Now, abstaining from our sinful desires, resisting them, no easy task. I mean, war is an apt word that Peter uses here. Even with the help of the Holy Spirit, it's a challenge, but it's possible. It's possible to abstain from those desires and to be, live out righteous lives. And it's absolutely critical that we take up that fight if we're going to bless our community. Because our world, our community, needs to see Christ followers who, for example, are, are quick to forgive when wronged, who are quick to show compassion to those in need, even if they share worldviews that are so different from that of the Christ follower. They need to see Christians who love unconditionally the unlovable. Our community needs to see examples of Christians who are making purity a priority in their lives by abstaining from sexual immorality in all of its form whether all of its forms whether it's having sex outside of marriage or indulging in pornography the world needs to see christians whose politics are shaped by faith and not the other way around the community needs to see christians who are generous with their time and with their talent and with their money in support of those efforts that bless others, just like you heard in, in the stories of those who have contributed to the effort to bless the, the refugees from Afghanistan. But we're not just called to be good, we're also called to do good. And, and that's just a natural outcome of being good. You can't be good without doing good. Now, Christians are not called to retreat from culture. Some Christians think so, but no, that's not the call. Dave Faust uh, a preacher in Indianapolis area says, churches dare not engage in a sad game of hide and seek in which our members hide behind the walls of the church building, timidly inviting outsiders to seek the treasures hidden inside. No, we're called to go out there. We're called to engage the world. And the best way we engage the world is through good works. That's what Peter is saying. Live such good lives among the pagans, being good and doing good. And, and so many in our church fellowship are doing that. You already heard several names, but other names like Alan Dillman and Kathy Thompson who serve in various capacities at Love Chapel or Sarah Joyner and Kara and Riley of our church who serve as uh, clarity group leaders. Dave Burnett and Jenny Hamilton who serve in jail ministry. Christy Farrell who works with Reach of Columbus, a, a newer program program that provides experiences and activities for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Jane St. Henry, who volunteers as a book buddy in our school system. Max Joyner, who leads our Helping Hands ministry that serves hot meals to the homeless in our community several times a month. How many of you have been a part of a Helping Hands effort? Several of you have, so many, and so many more things that people in our church do besides. Sometimes serving the community includes transformative efforts like the one we looked at last week about William Wilberforce who led the effort to end the slave trade in the United Kingdom over 200 years ago. Maybe God is calling you to engage in some effort that can impact the community in a transformative way. You know, the more I read about corrupt business leaders dominating the news right now, like the guy behind the FTX cryptocurrency scandal or Elizabeth Holmes of Theranos, the, the more I think the church should highlight the call, not just uh, of mission work or ministry or nonprofit work, but, but highlight the call of, of something like entrepreneurship. Because there is a place in the community for principal, godly Christian leaders who have the talent, who have the skill to create and build with integrity companies that employ and provide for hundreds of workers while at the same time blessing the community with goods and services that are needed. In other ways too, the church can bless the community by partnering with those efforts that, that build up, that, that lift up 
the community, that unify the community. I, I think our tower project is one such effort. You know, the tower is not only a symbol of the church directing eyes heavenward, it's also a symbol of Columbus and of what matters to Columbus, and that is beauty. Now, it, it is tempting to see in the tower nothing more than a stack of bricks. Well, why would I want to contribute to that when there's so many ministries and mission work and all kinds of things to support? And, and I get it. And, and I'm not sure that if we were building a new church building today that that would be our first priority to, to build a, a tower like that. However, there is something to be said and something that needs to be re rediscovered about the power of beauty the role of beauty in a community. In a piece written earlier, earlier this year called Why Our Churches Should Be Beautiful, Rebecca Henderson writes about how a church's architecture can be a witness to the community, saying, quote, for centuries, religious architecture featured cutting-edge techniques as a way to dedicate fine-tuned craftsmanship to God and demonstrate the riches and depths of His glory. In many communities, churches were the pinnacles of what architecture could do. Today, beautiful spaces of worship can still provide a sense of pride for the community as well as a place for reverence and reflection. As architect Suki Lung says, good architecture helps communities flourish by cultivating a healthy sense of collective identity. A meticulously designed church can not only impress a sense of beauty and awe upon an individual, but it can also share that feeling with its surrounding community. You know, if you support the Tower Project, you're not just investing in a stack of bricks. You're contributing to something that helps our community flourish through a reminder of an important truth. And that truth is this, as Henderson writes, God is the author and ultimate standard of beauty. As the wonders of our world testify, we do not worship a God who could care less about the details of his creation. Let's get engaged in small ways and in big ways in blessing our community. When the church and her people let God work through them like he wants, like he can. The community is better for it. Well, there's all kinds of benefits to being different, but here is the biggest impact from what we find in 1 Peter 2. Through your difference, through the difference you are being, through the difference you are making, others may come to know the difference maker. That's what Peter gives as his main reason. He says there in verse 12, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now, as I just said a moment ago, the world often makes life difficult for those who go against the grain of the world. And if we're following Christ right, we are going to be an against the grain of the world kind of people. So we shouldn't be surprised when the world, when the community can make life difficult for us. <laughs> In fact, Peter is preparing his readers for that very thing, and by extension, us. And when that happens, when the world pushes back, it's tempting for us to push back as well, to get defensive or become offensive. But that's not our call. Why? Because it's not about our work is not about winning arguments or proving those in the world wrong. It's about loving others so that they might encounter Christ in us. I've mentioned before this song by musician Randy Newman. He's not a Christian. In fact, I'm pretty sure he is an atheist. And yet, in, in one of his songs, unbeknownst to him, I'm guessing, he, he captures the heart of God for his wandering creation. The song is called Wandering Boy. It's written from the perspective of a father who's longing for his wandering boy. In the song, the father says about his wayward son, I hope he's warm and I hope he's dry and that a stranger's eye is a friendly eye and I hope he has someone close by his side. 
and I hope that he'll come home. Where is my wandering boy tonight? Where is my wandering boy? If you see him, tell him everything's all right. Push him toward the light. Where is my wandering boy? You know, maybe that stranger's eye is your eye that God is calling to be a friendly eye toward that wandering boy, toward someone who is far from him. Maybe it's you that God is calling to push that wayward person toward the light, the light of Jesus Christ. When someone (laughs) is making life difficult, difficult for you because of your faith, in response, in reaction to the difference that Christ is making in you, the most reasonable and normal thing to do is to push back is to give it to them like they're giving it to you. And that's precisely when it's so important that we show our difference in Christ. When hated, we love. When mocked, we are gracious. When we are taken advantage of, we continue to serve. When attacked, we bless. As Peter writes in chapter 3, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing. That's what being different is all about. It's not easy, but it may make all the difference in the world for that person and for their eternity. You know, being different because of who you are in Christ, it may not win you a lot of friends, but it may win some to Christ. And for that reason, let's give the gift of being different. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, In so many ways, your son Jesus, when he came into this world, stood out like a sore thumb, and the world hated him for it, the very world that he laid down his life for. That's what you're calling us to. I pray you'd find us faithful. I pray the world sees the difference that you are making in us. And even though the world may not always appreciate the many ways we seek to serve and bless our community, may we continue to serve and bless and love anyway so that they might see you and come out of darkness into the light of your son Jesus, in whose name I pray, amen.